Hey everyone, welcome back to the Neurologic Wellness Podcast. I'm here today with Dr. Casey Kelly of Case Integrative. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, thank you for having me. Of course. So Dr. Kelly, I believe we were talking about Lyme disease today, which is something that is becoming more and more prevalent uh, in our society. So I think our listeners are going to really value what you have to say today. Um, before we jump too deeply into the topic, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got uh, to where you are as far as treating Lyme disease? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's kind of a long story, but I'll, I'll give you the brief version. Uh, I am a, an integrative medicine medical doctor. I'm both certified in uh, board certified in family medicine as well as integrative medicine. And so I take a very broad-based holistic approach to health and wellness and that's pretty much the only kind of medicine I've practiced. I did a little bit of urgent care right after residency, and then I went right into an integrative medicine practice. And through that, I started digging more and more and trying to figure out what was wrong with these chronically ill patients. And in that process, actually learned that I myself have Lyme disease and other co-infections and my own health struggles over the years and made sense of all of that. And so I started to kind of dive into what that means. How do you treat it? You know, all these, the, the nuances of these, these chronic infections. And so by helping myself and starting to help patients, I've just, you know, started to, once you start down this road and looking for it, you find it more and more and you help, you're able to help more and more people. So it's been very, very rewarding I started my own practice case integrative health about three years ago, actually. Okay. We're, we're coming up on our three-year mark at this point. So congratulations. We've been, thanks. Yeah. Working on trying to help all kinds of people, all kinds of chronic complex illnesses, but Lyme is definitely one of, one of my focuses. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, we, uh, we love referring uh, a lot of our patients and working with you uh, you do great work over there. So very happy to get to talk to you today. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. It's a, it's um, good, yeah, good. Uh, it's a good collaboration. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so you mentioned you had Lyme disease and I, I find that uh, typically the most compassionate doctors tend to be the ones that have also been through what the patient is also struggling with. So I think that lends uh, something valuable to your to your patients who are uh, suffering with that as well but for those who may not even be aware of what Lyme disease is can you kind of define that for us and how one might even get it absolutely so Lyme disease is an infection caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi and it comes from a tick bite the reason why it's called Lyme disease is it was first found, um, especially in children, actually, in the 1970s and 80s in Old Lyme, Connecticut. So uh, these, these, there's this larger group of what they thought was juvenile rheumatoid arthritis patients um, that was actually found to be, um, this, this arthritis was actually caused by this bacteria found on the ticks. So that's why we call it Lyme disease. Uh, here in the States at least, but there are multiple Borrelia species of bacteria that cause human illness. And so a better word is actually probably Borreliosis, mm -hmm. um, but Lyme disease, it's actually in this world and our world, we're kind of where we live, we tend to um, use it as an umbrella term, if you will, to mean all kinds of tick-borne infections but there's a lot of different tick-borne infections and they all have little nuances in there. Mm -hmm. um, so you could have to talk about the group as a whole, but Lyme itself is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. Right, because um, the, per the particular bacteria or strain or tick that you might encounter in Connecticut might be completely different than, uh, or might be different than you know, Wisconsin or Florida. Um, is that right? 
Yes and no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're going to find these um, Borrelia species, multiple different Borrelia species in multiple different places. So Borrelia burgdorferi is in Connecticut. It's also in Illinois and Wisconsin and, and all over, but there are other Borrelia species as well mm -hmm. that you can, can find. So they don't necessarily just stick to one area, so they can mm -hmm. be kind of all around. Um, and there are different strains that are more European, if you will, but they're here in the States too. These, you know, these bacteria don't really know that they're yeah. supposed to stay in Europe or, or sure. whatever. They come sure. over here too. Yeah. 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 Uh, the pros and cons of a globalized world, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, so you mentioned that uh, the tick is uh, the primary vector, right? So um, if somebody were to see a tick on their body, what should they a first do? And then what would be kind of their first uh, sign that they should maybe get uh, get that looked at? Yeah. So ticks are tiny, first of mm -hmm. all. So it's really, really easy to miss a tick bite, especially when they're in the larva stage. It's about the size of a, uh, of a period on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So impossible to see at times. And if you find one on you, they don't paint, they're not painful. It doesn't hurt. So another reason to easily miss it. And they tend to crawl up um, upwards. They're a lot of times they're in our hair. Um, or on our back or somewhere where we can't see them. So it's very, very easy to miss them. So the first thing is to look for them. So even if you're out and about gardening, a lot of people ask me, you know, in Chicago, where we are, are there ticks around? Yes, I've actually had patients get ticks on them by sitting outside at a restaurant in Chicago. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be mindful and look for them. So especially if you're in an area that has more space, more woods, more deer, more mice, things like that, that are around that carry these guys around is to, to be on the lookout and always do a check and look for them. Even if you're just out for a stroll, walking the dog, check your dogs and pets mm -hmm. for ticks too. But the first thing you want to do if you find one embedded is remove it properly. So you do not, don't, don't listen to these wives tales of lighting them on fire using Vaseline. Um, that is not the way to remove them. Mm -hmm. You can use tweezers and you pull directly up, straight up, straight up on that tick until it lets go. There are also tick twister devices and tick keys, which I carry on my keychain actually, to, to help pull them off safely. They kind of pop off, it's rather gross. Um, so pull it off properly. You don't wanna leave the head in there. You wanna mm -hmm. pull the whole thing out. It will release if you just tug on it gently with the tweezers. And then you wanna send that tick in. For testing, especially if it's engorged and it's been there for a longer time. The longer it's connected to you, the, the higher chance of getting an infection from that tick. You can send the tick to a couple of different places to have it checked for infection. So you can look at tickreport.com or ticknology. Those are just a couple of places where you can send it in and they will check for Lyme as well as other co common co-infections. And you can depending on how much you want to spend, you can look for different co-infections. Um, they're much more likely to find these bacteria, parasites, et cetera, in the tick mm -hmm. than in you, mm -hmm. just kind of mind boggling. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an area where there's a lot of Lyme ticks, which newsflash, the Midwest is very prevalent in these guys, send it in, get it tested. Cause that's going to help the doctor know what you've been exposed to potentially. Right. So that's a good thing. Um, it is never a bad idea to take prophylactic or preventative treatment if you've got a, a tick bite on you and you, especially if you're in an area that's really high prevalence of Lyme or other tick-borne infections. Mm -hmm. There's some literature where one dose, for example, of doxycycline is beneficial. I'm not sure one dose one day is really gonna cut it, mm -hmm. but certainly if you have some telltale signs within the first month of that tick bite, you want to get on top of this. Don't, don't wait, get on top of it, um, is a bullseye rash. Mm -hmm. Now, most people don't get a bullseye rash. Most people who get rashes, only about 20% of those are actually bullseye rashes. So the odds of getting a bullseye rash, which is the quintessential, right. that is Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. If you have a bullseye rash, do not collect $200. Don't pass go, <laughs> like go take 30 days at least of treatment, 30, Absolutely. 30 days, not mm -hmm. one, not two weeks, 30 days. Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. 
you don't, you, you can't get tested that quickly. Your body won't be making antibodies that early. Mm-hmm. Nothing else makes a bullseye rash. Go get treated. Right. But again, most of us don't get a rash. And if we get a rash, it looks just like cellulitis or mm-hmm. doesn't have that quintessential bullseye rash. So be on the said they like to uh, uh, get in your hair, correct? So. Yeah, you know, and the rash will go away. It's not mm-hmm. painful. It's not itchy. So if it's in your scalp, mm-hmm. you would never see it. Right. If it's on your back and you, you know, that's not a place where you're typically going to look or have a partner who looks there, you're going to miss it because it will fade. It goes away after a week or so. Mm-hmm. So it's another, you know, another easy to miss picture of right. it. Right. So it seems like the, the prevalence is very high for a uh, tick-borne illness, especially here in the Midwest. Um, the likelihood of you actually seeing a tick on you is low and the likelihood of you seeing the uh, kind of the early signs of that tick bite are very low. So how how does one know that, uh, <laughs> how does one get diagnosed? Right? I, we've had lots of people years yeah. before they yeah. get diagnosed. So. And I think that's part of the problem is we, mm-hmm. um, uh, but we are doing a better job, I think, of advocating for patients. And so we're teaching the public more about what to look for and, and doing a better job of teaching providers of what to look for. So, you know, things to think about are the rash that we talked about, but also a, a, acutely a flu-like illness. You know, we live in a strange world these days. So if you have a flu-like illness that pops up, you should probably go ahead and do a nasal swab and make sure it's not COVID, you know? Um, But if you have a flu-like illness that pops up and it has a couple other markers. So one will be a migratory joint pain. So your, your wrist will hurt and then your knee will hurt and you might have swelling with those joints, but it will kind of move around, Mm -hmm. you know, and different joints will be affected. Uh, It could also just be widespread pain or achy flu-like pain as well. Mm -hmm. Fevers. Sometimes people will get fevers. And then the third one that usually pops up is some sort of brain fog, Mm -hmm. some cognitive slowing, some trouble thinking through the white, right words and getting, getting those words out. Um, Those are the things that will typically pop up pretty early on. So joint pain, um, brain fog, flu, like, oh, and fatigue, Mm -hmm. you know, this kind of unexplainable. I just took a shower. Now I have to take a rest. Mm-hmm. fatigue that can kind of come on rather suddenly with these infections. Mm-hmm. So if those pop up and those are out of the blue and those just like, where did this come from? Mm-hmm. Then you should really think about getting tested for some of these tick-borne infections. Yeah, because it, it is, it's a very acute progression, right? So it, it shouldn't take months to notice. Well, but it can, I guess, you know, mm-hmm. to some people, it's a little more subtle, so it's not quite as obvious. Sometimes these, when you get Lyme, you'll get a flu-like illness, fatigue, pain that lasts for a week or so, and it goes away. And you think, I had a cold, no big deal, you know, moving on yeah. with life. And then a month later, slowly, these, everything will start to creep back, more pain, more brain fog, more fatigue. And so it can be this a rather insidious process and it's very slow and it can start with just one thing too. It could just be fatigue. And so people go to multiple doctors trying to figure it out. Their labs are fine. Nothing's wrong with them. So the doctors go, it's psychosomatic or you're just depressed, you know, go see the psychiatrist because they can't figure it out because all of their labs are normal. And so that's when people end up with you and me, who've been dealing with this for five, 10, 15, 20 years, and no one's diagnosed it because no one's really looking for it because it wasn't an acute tick bite that they just got last week. Right, Right? exactly. Yeah. And then if somebody is now listening to this and they do suspect potential Lyme and they want to go through the process of maybe more uh, in-depth diagnosis, Uh, What does that look like typically? Well, this is another one of our issues that we've got with Lyme is there's not this great black and white test that you can get. Some tests are better than others. um, And there are some you can start off with, with your primary care doctor. The Western blot would be 
the place to start. There are screening tests for Lyme disease and the CDC wants you to do a screening test first and then do a Western blot. But quite honestly, the, sc the screening tests are pretty lousy. They miss over half of the people in some, in some literature. And that's a horrible screening test. A screening test is supposed to include too many people. And then you whittle it down with the confirm confirmation test. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are just doing this screening test. It's normal. It's not Lyme. On to the next, on to the next thing. So I usually just skip it altogether. Um, but the Western blot can be done. And there are certain criteria that the CDC have determined is a positive test. But mind you, that positive test is just for screening and surveillance purposes to be able to put a dot on a map. It was never intended for clinical diagnoses mm -hmm. per the CDC's website. You can check that out. But a lot of doctors will use that as a diagnostic term. So if you have a certain amount of bands positive on your Western blot, but it's not enough, mm -hmm. it's not Lyme, moving on. Um, so you really need to have a, you have to advocate for yourself as a patient, mm -hmm. which is hard to do. You have to continue to fight and find a provider who will listen to you and do the test and do the right test. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure, and you're still not getting where you want to go, find an integrative doctor or a functional doctor. Mm -hmm. They're going to actually stop and listen to you and do better tests or help you find the right person to get to the bottom of it. Cause right. Lyme or not, you need that kind of provider who's going to be there for you mm -hmm. to figure it out. So um, maybe somebody then finds their way to uh, your clinic. Um, what are some of the tests that uh, you might run? And um, I don't know that. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> ah, but, my new adult patients, I'm going to run like 20 vials of yeah. tests. It's, it's a lot of, of, of testing initially, but I'm just trying mm -hmm. to be complete. Yeah. So for Lyme, I usually will use, um, IGENX labs, which is one of the grandfathers of vector borne infection testing or vibrant labs, which is a really, really good panel. Um, there are a couple other labs too. Some of these are covered by insurance. Some are not just trying to look for Lyme as well as other co-infections. So these other bacteria, parasites, and things that come on ticks. Um, but I'm also going to be doing a lot of immunological tests too, to look for inflammation or different shifts that happen in the immune system because of these infections. That's a big part of dealing with them, especially when they're chronic. Chronic Lyme is a different beast altogether than acute Lyme. So that these are the patients that have been dealing with this for years and no one can figure it out. So I have to look at that immune system too, and see where those imbalances are so I can work on building that into part of the healing process as well. So. And then say we have a patient who was lucky enough to think that it may be Lyme. They were then directed to you. You were able to determine maybe it's Lyme or that it is Lyme. What then would treatment look like for this individual? I know there are a ton of different approaches when it comes to Lyme treatment, like some very interesting uh, treatment approaches that I've heard of, but um, <laughs> what, what, what are some ways that you've found to be effective, I guess, in your office? Yeah, I mean, I wish it were simple mm -hmm. and I could, you know, say here are the three things, right? But right. it's so much more complex than that, especially mm -hmm. when you've got chronic cases and they've got Lyme and Bartonella and Epstein-Barr virus and neurological derangement and joint pain and all the things and mm -hmm. gut issues, et cetera. Um, so I take a very individualized approach to each patient and meet them where they are and try to figure out all the different moving puzzle pieces, um, and keep all of those, you know, a juggle, try to juggle all those balls and keep them in the air to, to help figure out what's the best way to treat them. But I can use multiple different things. So it really depends on what the patient needs and, and where we kind of can go with it, but there are prescription antibiotics. There are herbal antibiotics. We use a lot of supplements. We use a lot of diet. We talk about neurological healing and repairing of the nervous system, gut healing, um, peptides, IV therapy. You know, I, I've got a pretty big toolbox and I'm constantly looking for new, cool, safe and effective ways to help people get better. So there's not one approach and it's not, you know, a, a specific algorithm on how to treat everybody, it's very individualized. 
but I can pull from different places. So it's pretty cool. And you can kind of combine different areas. It's, it's a lot of fun. Right, right. Yeah. No, no Lyme patient is going to be exactly the same, but it takes someone like you with a vast uh, amount of tools to be able to appropriately determine what tool is going to work best for this particular patient. So that's great. Um, and that actually brings me into my follow-up question. Um, we're definitely a neurologic focused uh, podcast and clinic. Um, and you mentioned neurologic uh, issues as well. How exactly does Lyme affect the brain? Uh, on a lot of levels, not mm -hmm. just the central nervous system, but the peripheral nervous system as well. I mentioned brain fog is usually a very common early symptom where people just feel like they're moving through sludge to get their thoughts out and really process things and they can't multitask and do everything they used to. Mm -hmm. Um, but symptomatically, I mean, it can cause so many different neurological symptoms, headaches, numbness and tingling, postural orthostatic tachycardia, autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Um, it's been linked to things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, I've seen Parkinsonian like symptoms from it. So it's MS. It often gets mimics MS like symptoms. So the, it's kind of the full range of neurological symptomatology and, and disorders have been or can be linked to Lyme or other vector-borne illnesses. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you can correct me if uh, you feel like this metaphor isn't uh, quite accurate, but what I typically tell patients, you know, who I may suspect that have Lyme and I want them to see you, for example, I tell them that, uh, to kind of think of things as like a house fire, right? So there's this, this immunological inflammatory process going on because of the infection. And what you're gonna do a great job at is stopping the fire. And then what we do a good job at is kind of rebuilding the house. And I think that's where uh, kind of the synergy of our two clinics works uh, really well uh, together, especially with yes. neurological uh, complaints. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I get totally get behind that metaphor. Fantastic. Okay, I'll keep using it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So we kind of talked about kind of the negative things that can happen if one were to get Lyme disease. What can someone do from a preventative standpoint to uh, hopefully avoid getting it? Oh, good question. Because what I don't want people to do is to be afraid to go outside because mm -hmm. nature is very healing. And I think it's really good for us to be outside, especially since we've been so cooped up inside as of late. The biggest thing is just to, to be aware and be take action to prevent things. So one is wear proper clothing. Um, I bought hiking boots that come up to my shin that I can take, hike my uh, pants into, tuck my pants into, because I don't want the ticks to be able to climb on my shoe and then, you know, climb onto my skin and climb up because you will not feel that. So it's best to be very fashion forward, tuck your pants into your boots or your socks, whatever you got. Um, and wear light colored clothing because you'll be easier to see the tick on your clothing. Um, get it off, you know, and get it off your clothing. You can treat your clothing. You can pre-treat your clothing, include your gardening clothes, your golf clothes, you know, your hiking clothes, your camping clothes, whatever, uh, with something called permethrin. You can get this at any sporting goods store, it's about nine bucks. Uh, spray everything down, including your socks and your hats and everything outside. Please do this outside. Permethrin is toxic, so just do it outside. Once it's dry, those clothes are protected. The ticks will fall off. So we won't get in you. You don't want to. You do not want to use that on your skin. You want to use um, non-toxic tick repellents on your skin. I like Ranger Ready, which is. Um, and I, I, I always butcher the name of this, uh, chemical picker, picker, picker it. And oh my gosh, you get ranger yeah. ready. That's the yep. brand. That's the <laughs> stuff you want to get. Um, and then there's also uh, a brand called repel that has a lemon eucalyptus oil based. Mm -hmm. Those are for your skin. So you want to spray your skin with everything too. Um, and then, um, do tick checks when you come in, the sooner you get them off of you, the better. So if you, you know, don't be too alarmed if you see them, but send them in to get tested, if you find them, the those tick results come back rather quickly. So if something is positive on there, even if you don't have symptoms, you can treat it still in that acute phase. 
So that's that's good money to spend to have those tick tests done. But there's other things you can do for your yard too. This is actually one thing the CDC does well. They have some good expl explanations on how to help protect your yard too, especially if you're mm -hmm. in a wooded area in ways to help protect that. And, and there are things called tick tubes that you can make online or not make online, find online how to make them, put them in your yard there to help reduce the overall tick levels around mm -hmm. you as well. So there's a lot of things you can do to prevent this. Mm -hmm. It's about being aware and then go outside and enjoy life right. and don't, and don't be too scared. Right. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Not good to live in fear, but also be, be cautious and informed. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this question, just because this is a human focused uh, podcast, but you did mention that there's the potential that a dog or cat might uh, also get Lyme. Uh, what might someone do if they're worried about that outside of, you know, your regular uh, flea and tick prevention? Yeah, vets are actually really good at picking these up. I don't know if their testing is different or just animals prevent present differently or, or what, but vets are very good at, at picking up on it and treating it. But there are um, tick medications and tick collars and things too that you can give to your to your pets to help reduce the risk of them them getting it as well. But also check check them for it too. Check in their ears. That tends to be a place where the ticks hide. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, we are just coming up on time, Dr. Kelly. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you want to make sure our listeners are aware of? You know, one thing I wanted to mention too, just related to neurological symptoms mm -hmm. is, are, are the mood changes that can happen? I have some patients who this new onset anxiety is the only symptom they have. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also, Lyme is also related to pans pandas, which is an autoimmune encephalopathy. Um, it's often in children, but adults can have this too with um, ticks, T-I-C-S, um, OCD, you know, acute rather abrupt behavior changes. So that's an aspect too of, of neurological inflammation as well. So sometimes it's just mood, not necessarily numbness or headache sure, as well. Sure. So, yeah. so especially if it comes kind of out of seemingly nowhere, yeah. maybe a good idea to get that checked out. Absolutely. And if uh, a patient is listening or someone is listening to this and uh, they think they may have Lyme or they're curious about getting uh, checked out, how might they find you in your clinic? Yes, give us, a, give us a shout out. You can look at our website at caseintegrativehealth.com. Um, we're also on Instagram and you can call the office 773-675-1400. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Dr. Kelly, this was fantastic, incredibly informative. Um, if anyone is concerned with Lyme at all, I think this is going to really help them uh, get pointed in the right direction. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having me. And this is a very important topic. And I'm so grateful of you and your team looking for this and, and helping our patients fight this and, and get back to health. So thank you guys too. Yeah, thank you. Definitely. Likewise. So uh, and this has been your host from the Neuro Wellness Podcast. Be well.